what kind of parting advice would you give to aspiring tier one players, people in tier two, tier three that that want to take the next step? You know, it always feels like kind of a well duh kind of answer, but it's the piece of advice that people take the least, which is just do shit. Stop talking about how you want to bridge the gap from tier two to tier one or tier three to tier two or whatever. Set up like a proper structure. Make sure that you're finding players who are bought into the type of system that's going to allow you to succeed and start grinding. And as long as you are actually working hard and not thinking about how you're going to work hard, you'll get there eventually. Hey guys, my name is Adblox and I'm a professional Valorant coach. This series of podcasts is aimed at bringing knowledge to aspiring professional players in the Valorant scene and the wider esports scene. We talk to professional coaches, professional players, performance coaches, people that work in organisations to bring you the value that you need to become a professional player. Today I'm talking to Anders. Anders is technically the most decorated coach in Valorant with the highest win rate of any coach. He was as you may or may not know, Fnatic's strategic coach. And so today we're going to talk all about Valorant strategy, everything you need to know, the absolute basics that you need within your team in terms of strategy, systems, comms, all of the things you need to build a base level foundation for your team to work with. Really great episode, absolutely packed with value. One of my favorite strategic discussions so far. You're going to love it. Sit back, relax and enjoy. So I guess I guess the first thing to say is I've I've been watching your content for a long time, as I'm sure a lot of people have. Certainly, a lot of coaches in the scene. I'm sure people that are kind of invested in the the esports part of of the game, right? Have been I've probably been watching your content for a long time. So, like first of all, just thank you. You know, like I think it obviously takes a lot of effort to do to do those kind of things, and I think I I wish I had more time and inclination to kind of do the kind of thing that you're doing because it's it's you know it's really meaningful to the to the community so i appreciate it and i'm and i'm sure there's a huge number of other people that do i, I appreciate the appreciation because it is uh I obviously enjoy doing the content otherwise i wouldn't do it but to say that there is a uh, large audience or a reward on my side of things for making it would be a gross overstatement i think i've made for my entire youtube channel of almost 100 videos less than yeah. 50 us dollars so <laughs> yeah i'm starting to realize that like a podcast like this where i'm talking to people really deeply embedded in the scene is not something that's going to make me lots of money right yeah that's that's for sure that, you cannot be anyone who kind of wants to get into esports you cannot be motivated by money because you're just an idiot <laughs> if that's the reason yeah. you're getting into it right and unless you're really focused on pumping out the the like the highlight videos or, or whatever or you know or the uh one pro beats five bronze players videos then yep. yeah then you're probably looking in the wrong place so yeah the, the first question i wanted to ask is why if, if someone came to you and they were kind of they were thinking about kind of getting into esports more seriously why do you think they should spend time studying strategy how would you persuade someone i mean this is like kind of a non-answer but i would first make sure that that's actually what they want to do in esports right like i, I don't mm. think that me selling you on strategy is something that i should be trying to do i think there has to be like an underlying passion for it right because mm. i mean like mm. th there's multitude roles in esports it's like you you don't have to be a coach let alone a specifically strategic coach you've got the types who are much more like uh, interpersonal relationship managers like uh infrastructural management like team organizational level stuff almost like a gm would would sort of function and then you've got people who do care about getting into the nitty gritty and i mean there are there are people in camps who would say that being a hyper strategic coach like i am is actually like on the overall a net negative approach to running a team mm -hmm. um you've got folks who would say that like the best teams in the world and there's there's tons of evidence of this i mean you can use league of legends as debatably the best example where strategy is very frequently and debatably optimally driven by players um so for me to say oh you want to come to esports let me sell you on strategy 
I think that if I have to do that, you shouldn't be going into strategy. You should be so passionate about it that there was never any question that you were going to pursue it in the first place. Otherwise, you're probably not going to be able to be useful to the point where overriding that player-driven strategy is ever going to be worth it. I think that's a great answer, actually. <laughs> um, I guess, let me, let me slightly rephrase the question. I think I think what you've said is important, but I guess... Okay, kind of going up one step further. How much strategy do you think it's important to players on teams to understand? It depends on the player. I mean, having an incredibly like in-depth understanding of, of strategy is super important, especially for like an IGL, obviously. But mm. um, there's like the the classic like military concept of like commander's intent, right? I think that the majority of players their level of understanding when it comes to that strategy can sort of stop at the commander's intent which is i understand what we're trying to do at a fundamental level the like minute intricate machinations of how that exactly manifests somewhat become moot in the noise mm -hmm. but if the intent is like implicitly understood by every moving part that is the most important thing is it valuable to then have a specific individual in the machine like the igl to have like a fairly deep understanding of the theory that then underpins that and can modify that in like the active flow of a game that's super valuable um but having like five players who could write a textbook on theory is not necessary <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i think i think that's valid um yeah, so I guess well, where would you draw that line, right? I mean, I'm happy to go like go into the details of this. We have we have the time, right? Like, yeah. w how much would you be giving to players, right? Or 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 to a player, how much do you think they should be looking looking for? How deep do they need to go? Yeah, um, I think that like this is kind of a funny example, but like one of the YouTube videos I made was like, oh, 60 must know terms for Valorant theory, and a lot of people meme on that video because there are things in that that. Frankly, I would never expect a player to know because it's terms for theory, which I consider completely separate from the game. And mm. usually what happens is where that theory becomes valuable is when you are trying to like break meta games. You are trying to be the bleeding edge. You're trying to cut through all of the nonsense and create something entirely new. The players don't have to be the ones driving that. The, the players need to understand the strategy insofar as it applies to literally playing the game yeah. not do i have to under like i can tell a player you should buy x y and z under x y and z conditions they don't have to understand the excel spreadsheet that i use to get to that outcome mm -hmm. they can get the, the the final hit instead of the here you go memorize this like that just doesn't make sense in in practical applications um and there's a lot of things that are similarly in that vein i mean my sort of claim to fame at this point is like all the style dynamic stuff, the application yeah. of agro control and mid range to Valorant. There's a shitload of numbers underpinning that. I mean, we've gotten to the point now where I, the version that I have like publicly exposed and like made the video on is the 2.0 version of that. I'm on version like 11.0, um, where I have like coefficients applied to like the second variance in duration of certain utilities, the minimum time to draw, like the maximum uh, like time to effect, things like that. And the amount of just quantitative mumbo jumbo that is now used in that system is something a player never needs to know. But does them knowing when something is aggro control or mid range benefit their understanding of the flow of a game? Yes. And so that's what I'm going to communicate to them. I'm not going to go into the unnecessary details of how I got to those valuations of everything that I'm trying to describe. It's definitely much more qualitative in that way, right? Or, mm -hmm. or a, if this, then that kind of situation, yeah. right? I mean, I think actually, actually think algorithms loosely mm -hmm. use that term, but algorithms are a good way to approach the game often or decision trees, uh, right? Because al they're algorithmic simple. systematized thinking, like all, all of that stuff is, is super valuable. I mean, that's, the, the infamous protocols like that's all that is is it's it's systematized like algorithmic thinking if then do this like that's all it is yeah yeah and i think i think f even for me you know I, I tend not to 
I tend not to go deeper than that. I'm, I'm definitely not a strategic coach and I wouldn't, wouldn't ever sell myself as that. I have, I have the, 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 the shallowest understanding that's possible to operate at the level that, that, that I do. Enough well, maybe that's dangerous. not quite true, but yeah, yeah. Uh, en enough, to, enough to say that, but then at the same time, I still think that my motto would be apes together strong, <laughs> right? Nice. Doesn't, yeah. doesn't always matter. The decision-making is, of course, important if you want to minimize risk, but at the end of the day, if you're playing together, you're probably going to beat someone, even if they're making the right decision, because well, they they may not have they may not be fast enough or whatever. You know, so many other human factors into it that uh, add to that variance. Mm -hmm. So I guess I kind of wanted to talk to you a bit about kind of like your your systems. I guess more the surface level stuff, the things that kind of players can can take and and run with. What what are the kind of the most important kind of systems that you like to implement within a team? Oh man, I mean, I think that, I mean, this is such a broad question. I think that course, the, big, yeah. The, yeah, the, the biggest things for me is like, there are core elements to playing this game at a high level that are mm. chronically overlooked. Like something as simple as like having proper comm structures in place where it's like, yeah, this is the IGL who does all the pre-rounding, but we're going to take a burden off of this IGL and we're going to have people who are in charge of calling both teams alt economies, another player who's in charge of calling both teams uh, like normal economies, and then that's yeah. going to additionally layer onto our game flow. Like, that will literally give you a round or two a map. Just yeah. the fact that someone has a literal job of keep track of this. Uh, someone said, sure yeah, they've got kill trial, to... guys. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, and like it goes beyond that because it's like, oh, they have kill, like they have this ultimate. Oh, they have these fence ultimates. Like these are one or two pips off. We need to be aware that they might go and play for these. And oftentimes that will contextualize what you expect your opponent to do. Mm. Like if they're one pip off of a, like a potent retake ultimate, we should probably play orb denial on both half of the maps, huh? Like that seems like a good game plan here. Um, otherwise, we could have the best exec in the world, and we're still probably going to lose the round unless we high roll and kill this agent in the process of executing. So, like, creating structures where, like, those sort of comm systems exist, where we're trying to actively keep track of, like, the important things in a game. And I mean, that sort of tacks on to, like, okay, well, what are the important things in the game? Like, yeah. I have... I have big systems for like alt economy and understanding how to sort of cascade from one alt to the another uh, to the next. I think that we've seen a little bit of this as as Valorant's matured and it's become kind of commonplace with I would say the top like five to ten teams in the world, at least in some games, to the point where people have stopped making it a conversation point. But alt economy is far more intricate than we like this ulti, let's give this guy all the orbs. Like, that, <laughs> that, that is the most fundamental layer humanly possible. The I'm not sure. I'm not sure even every tier one team's doing, doing as much no. as that, even. Uh, I think yeah, it's a, it's a well, big discussion, saying, actually. Like, yeah. I, I say 10 teams. How many franchise teams do we have now, including yeah, China? 30, like, 30, 40? Is it yeah, 10, per, so 10 like, per region? W one in four tier one teams is like doing the most basic element of alt economy management nice uh, yeah and yeah. Th th there's layers b beyond that which is like okay we like this ulti and we're allocating a bunch of orbs to it but how do we then create a circumstance where based off of like the expected number of kills deaths and plants mm. that we get mm. on this map per half how can we ensure that we're never more than one round away from another ultimate mm. Mm. and like if you can actually pull that off you'll just run over teams like, it yeah. will get to a, a point of pure suffocation, especially if you have good ultimates in your composition. Um, so, I mean, ulticon, like, keeping track of it, obviously huge factors to, like, how teams can perform at a high level. And I think that it's probably the lowest hanging fruit in terms of, like, if, if I were to go run a premier team with a bunch of, like, randos, I could apply that, and it would be positive ran round delta every single map we played. So it mm, just would. Mm. Um, then you've got, I mean, going to normal economy. It's kind of in limbo right now. All of the like tenets of a properly managed economy that I would have told you two and a half weeks ago are probably no longer true. Just buy the outlaw. 
right? <laughs> I, so I don't think you should just buy the outlaw. That's my thing. Is I'm I, I'm one of the few people that I am I'm claiming as a voice of reason. Literally the yeah the yeah I've seen your tweets. The first yeah. day that people were like, "Oh my god, this is OP," I was like, "Y'all need to calm down. This is fine. Like it's a sniper that fills an economic niche where there wasn't a sniper." You're still going to prefer an op over it in any situation mm -hmm. that you can reasonably afford the op over it. Like, this gives you some really janky, obnoxious stuff you can do with Chamber, but that's, like, the worst of it, and Chamber still isn't optimal on the majority of the map pool, even with this yeah. gun considered. So, yeah. like... It's not that terrifying, can... right? It, exactly. It's like, no need to be running and screaming, like, the village isn't on fire. Calm down. <laughs> well, and if it, if it's that broken, right? Then oh no, the sheriff must be broken, right? Because we're just gonna we're just gonna headshot everyone anyway, right? Well, so it, even the argument that like oh this was like it it absolutely just like eviscerates the half armor meta. Like, do people not realize that the guardian could already do that yeah. at like a gross level of efficiency? Like that was the guardian farmed light armor strats. You just two body shot people. The TTK mm. is faster than like any Anything. situation where you're not just one tapping someone in the head like yeah it was great and you had like obscene hip fire accuracy like it, to to say that like this is some like magnitude like uh, like high magnitude earth altering adjustment to the game because they brought in the outlaw is just you either weren't looking at the tools that we had before or you're overblowing this due to recency bias and everyone buying it in your ranked games <laughs> It's interesting, right? Because uh, I think actually a lot of the meta isn't probably like a lot of the stock market. In fact, isn't actually driven by the numbers. It's driven mm -hmm. by the behavior of the people and their beliefs. Mm -hmm. Doesn't really matter whether something is, you know, like like you look at specific stocks and you can you can evaluate whether they're actually good to buy or not. But someone might just say, no, I like Tesla. I'm just going to keep on buying Tesla, and the price keeps on going up despite all of yep. the indicators maybe suggesting otherwise. GameStop stock. Yeah, that, that, yeah, right. We can just go crazy. Stuff. Yeah, like it, the 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 market can stay irrational as long as it wants, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, eventually it will correct, and I think that's probably the same for people's behavior in the game. Right? We're gonna go through a phase of everyone buying the outlaw and saying, "Oh, it's crazy," and we're gonna get lots of Twitter posts of, "Oh no, I just got destroyed by someone with a oh, with the a." With one again the funny you know. thing is like if if we look at like ludwig Terek that's going on right now we aren't yeah, seeing yeah. that like we're seeing we're seeing it used in the niche scenarios where it's good now i say all of this i wouldn't be surprised because i haven't done like the deep spreadsheet diving if down the road someone finds just some heinous efficient like third and fourth round buy combo that yeah just sure. becomes objectively the correct thing to do under all circumstances but nobody's found it yet Otherwise, I would probably know about it in the circles that I talk in. So, like, the the jury's out. But I, I genuinely just think people are overblowing it. But we'll see. I mean, e econ management is always a huge, like, area to produce advantage. I mean, just look at what Fnatic did with Light Armor. Like, Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, it's you, you it's become, like, the thing. Need, yeah, well, you don't need further evidence. It's like, this is, that's probably the most, like, dramatic quantified example of like yeah no this literally like wins them rounds so can't even deny it mm. So. Mm. i i love what you say about comm systems i guess the interesting thing is <clears throat> from, from my point of view where i come in from the slightly different am angle of you know i'm more the kind of coach that works on the kind of behavioral side of things and, and mm -hmm. i focus much more on the people than i do on the strategy and I guess as much as I can try and weave those two things together. How do you kind of create that buy-in? I think sometimes it's a challenge to say to players, no, you know, like this, this player is going to call the alts, this player is going to call the, the economy and this player is going to do, and this player's your IGL, right? So then he plans following that, having heard that and maybe even, I, I guess the kind of system I like to follow is kind of what you've described. Plus, uh, okay, any information slash important reads that you've had tells from the opponents. You know, they do this arrow, they do this thing, and this means they're going to do that. Mm -hmm. Pile those things in together, you systematize your communication. How how, how do you kind of... It's, it's easy to kind of tell the players that that's like, that's the right thing, right? And it's the same mm -hmm. with a lot of other stuff that you've said. Like, it's easy to say that's the right thing. Persuading people is often the hardest bit. How do you kind of go about doing that? For me, it's all like 
my background in in finance and private equity like i i have a de degree in finance i'm an internationally published system dynamicist like it, quantifying stuff that probably shouldn't be quantified is kind of a specialty of mine and so when it comes to getting buy-in from players i will just give them irrefutable Perfect. evidence that this is this will win us more games period yeah. like it, it will not be questionable so like if i'm telling you without a shadow of a doubt this will win us more games it's literally your job to buy into this like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you, like you are here to to play at the highest level you can this will per this evidence win us more rounds I shouldn't have to do anything more to get you to buy in. If if you don't buy in at that point, you're probably never going to be a cultural fit for a tier one team. So yeah, that becomes a different issue. Yes, yes, I to I totally agree with you. But then I guess the question then becomes really in a lot of ways why are and I think hopefully a lot of the kind of audience I'm aimed at right the kind of aspiring pros people maybe well, mm -hmm. people that are semi pros tier two tier three maybe making making that step. I think people have to realize that. You should be plugging for every advantage you can get, right? And and like the stuff, the the, the content that you put out there is often very persuasive of, of of something. You know, this is this is something you should do. You should do it like that. I think people need to realize that, you know, you, you should be going for those advantages. And and systematizing things often is because it's a lot often more about consistency, right? It's about removing yeah. the variance and 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 bringing exactly. your bottom your bo bottom end up. Yeah, I I am like a long time TCG player, so. I think a lot of my understanding of like quantifiable edge and variance reduction is super valuable in this game. I, I frequently describe myself as like, I'm not the coach that's going to take an awful team and make them great. I'm a coach that's mm. going to take the great team and give them the half a percent that makes them world champion. Mm. And so mm. that speaks to what you're saying, where it's like, you should be chasing every single like grain of like positive advantage you conceivably can get and at the highest levels each like fraction of those percentage advantages is extremely hard to chase because there's diminishing returns right it's like yeah, yeah. It, it, it's an it's an exponential curve where when you when you get to that top end you are jumping through a thousand hoops to get like a half a percent yeah and that's yeah. that's what i personally specialize in is i will get you that half percent more efficiently than any other coach on earth realistically can because it's what i've been doing since the game came out i've mm -hmm. been creating these systems from the get-go to chase percentage points that nobody else has even tried to chase so let's let's circle back we can chase those half a percent mm -hmm. how how would how how could people kind of start, I guess? Like, what are the biggest percentage games, gains that you would give? Okay, so we've systematized our comms. Yep. Let's say we've I done mean, that. I think building out effective playbooks is, like, the most, like, nebulous, all-encompassing way to describe this. Like, you can look at, the, I would say, like, the team operational level things, which is like, okay, we have functional comms. We have role siloing in our team that, like, is actually functional. Like, What do you mean by role play? siloing? Uh, people understanding what each role in a team is meant to do what agents that means that they have to play and creating an environment that allows their players to succeed uh if you have your jet player pivoting onto chamber on like or the the e the easiest uh example to like sort of tease and and meme on is like the entire year where jet players were playing chamber yes that was like that was just wrong I'm I'm going to be honest. In my opinion, and per quantifiable evidence, that was the wrong way to operate your team. Period. Your du your duelist should have stayed a duelist. Your sentinel should have learned how to off. That's that's just the way it is. Because I think part of the functional role of a sentinel is to be able to op anchor. Like that that is part of their job. So the fact that people were like, "Oh, well, we already have an opera. We're just going to put them over," changed the core function and the intent of how that player had to operate how do you go from being a duelist who is frequently the first in and seeking aggressive advantage and then saying you're gonna play this anchor character now like what sort of whiplash are you trying to impose on your players in that scenario and how is that setting them up to succeed it's just not and you're not going to convince me otherwise like it, it doesn't make any sense it never did um and so i think having a clear understanding of you as a player play this functional role 
And that isn't like a you play X, Y, and Z agent or like you are always doing this. It's what does your job like what is your job in the game Mm -hmm. in actual like practical terms? Like if you are the entry, like your job is to be explosive. Your job is to seek aggressive delta. It's to take high risk, uh, high risk, like uh, high return potential uh, opportunities like that's your job so these are the agents that you're gonna play oh you're like our third in person who's often playing like a initially supportive but then like consistent trading uh like position the these are the agents that you're gonna have to play in that and that's not necessarily the things that people always will associate with that role like a lot of people will be like oh so that's just like always our info initiator all the time it's like no no it's not like they they're playing some things that are not going to be like intuitively put into that silo like that player should probably be playing harbor are are people having that person play harbor currently in like any level of pro play absolutely not because they're not trying to think like in the pack what is that player's function what do they do what is their job like who are they trading off of who do they have natural synergies with who have who do they have an ingrained like almost subconscious understanding of how that player is going to approach the way that they clear angles how they route like creating repeatable behaviors in your players Mm -hmm. where they understand implicitly how the others are going to operate around them is just going to increase their ability to succeed and a huge part of that is keeping their roles consistent if i'm changing your role between every single map the level of that like subconscious understanding is going to be less than it could be i love that i mean i i totally agree with you right it isn't about the agents it's about your role within the team mm-hmm. the the mechanics of that are a separate separate issue for sure it it even goes so far as like and i think this is the one that even teams i've worked with haven't gotten to the point where we're perfectly capturing this is Mm. i think that your sentinel and controller players shouldn't be the same person on a pretty frequent basis because certain maps require those players to be extremity anchors and other maps require them to be with the pack and people right now are creating they're creating a false equivalence where that is the same across every map in the pool when it's it, it just shouldn't be like the roles are very very different and i mean kudos to the like sentinel and controller players who make it look not like shit when they're doing that um but i still don't think it's optimal the way that it's being done a lot of the time interesting do you have a specific example i mean where where you kind of split split is like the example um like if if you look, it, it's less so now. I mean, the meta's been dynamic enough on that map where I think that this example probably loses like a, a little bit of its teeth. But the amount of times that we've seen uh, attacking controllers be an extremity anchor and just like a containment role towards uh, B main versus mm-hmm. how many times we've seen those controllers have to be with the pack across the rest of the map pool creates like a very weird role dichotomy there, right? Like. I'm hard posted on B main, maybe going for a lurk play. I might be joining the pack late for like an A split, or maybe I'm like doing a deep spawn rotation and joining the lurker A main, and like that's that's my way into this site. On a lot of other maps, the controller is just always with the pack. Like mm. they are they are one of the key people that is moving with like the core three. And you have like a Sova as an extremity anchor or a Sky as an extremity anchor because you need some sort of info cycle. And so mm. those are two like totally like categorically different things to be doing as a player. Yeah. And yet I'm saying be with the pack in this one, focus on tradeability, understand your interactions with these players. But on this map, I want you to understand lurk timings and how to play an extremity anchoring position correctly and just do them both. It's fine. Like, it's interesting mm. that that's sort of where we've landed um, in the way that most tier one teams are are structuring their roles. Yeah, it's interesting because I guess people, players, you know, I, I have a background as a player as well. So I guess it's interesting to kind of see, to reflect on my own mindset on that as well. Because you're very focused on the mechanics of doing your role rather than the theory underpinning it, right? You think about... How, you know, am I going to be able to do smokes well and quickly? Am I going to be able to use my utility? Can I sky flash without flashing on my whole team? You know, th- mm-hmm. those kind of things. 
um, rather than how how do I need to operate within the team environment? Who do I need to have synergy with? Those those kind of things. I, I want to go on a little tangent here because yeah, please do. So, the, the way you phrase that just made me think of something that I think is yeah. worth pointing out is. I think that because that is the natural way of thinking about the game, we have seen a complete lack of maturity in the game in that more theoretical focused role context. And if you mm -hmm. need any further evidence of that, look at a player like Demon One. He can go cross role and be fantastic because the mechanical side of his execution is flawless. And the game is so immature still that the theory side of those roles is so irrelevant that it almost becomes moot. He can still succeed mm. at a world champion level cross silo because the mechanics are there. And at this point, the mechanics still trump all. You're the second person to say this to me recently. And I, and I, I think that's, that's it was very interesting, actually. Yeah, that we're, we're still kind of at that. Actually, no, the, per the other person that said it to me said, I don't know if we'll ever get to a point where that's not the case because I don't think people I mean, are... It's maybe not smart enough, right? But, you know, None to that. of the people... I mean, it's like I was saying. Like, how many people are chasing these half a percents? Well, and yeah. Like, we're, we're talking like 50 people in the world, right? <laughs> I would to... argue that it is less than that. You could probably count yeah. them on your fingers. Like, Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we'll never get to that point. I don't know. Uh, there's a distinct likelihood, honestly. I mean, if, if I stay in the scene, we will get there. I promise. But it'll take me a while. <laughs> there what ah now this is where i forget exactly where i wanted to go next because you you said something really interesting before yes have you talked about this kind of siloing before is this something uh, like how, yeah, how do you define the silos i guess um so uh, i've been doing this since the very beginning of my coaching career honestly i think that one of the things that if you look at my track record stands out most poignantly is like my first serious four into Valorant coaching was like Virtuoso, my North American free agent roster, which went from quite literally like a bunch of ex Crossfire players and some other guys that they found and ranked to the highest rated NA free agent team by the mm -hmm. time that I left for Fnatic. And that squad, when I left, was the longest standing roster period in North America. We stayed together as a five stack longer than any other team in the history of the game up to that point, including tier one teams that were on contracts, including tier two teams, didn't matter. We were the longest standing roster in the entire game at that point in time. Hmm. And the reason that we stuck it out so long is because we knew what everyone's roles were. We were bought into like a long-term growth, like here are all these systems. We're going to work until these systems gel and we actually mm. get where we want to go. Mm. Um, and by creating those, like that sort of environment, it allowed the players to flourish. I mean, one of the players from that team went on to uh, coach Mad Lions briefly. Two of them went on to sign contracts with Renegades. One of them ended up on Evil Genius's uh, reserve roster. Like, for the players, like, from from where that roster began to where it ended and what happened to the players' careers, that is pretty compelling evidence that creating highly structured roles and sticking it out long enough for those roles to stick and for those players to get those like deep understandings mm. of what those roles are meant to do is going to be extremely valuable for their success. Yeah, I mean, I, to I totally agree with you. I guess, I guess my thought process is how, how have you defined them? Do you, do you have names for, for like the specific course, like the specific roles themselves? Well, what nomenclature do you use to describe the kind of five different roles that you see within a team? Uh, I'll be honest, I just for the sake of like under like how easy to understand it is. Yeah, I've fallen into many of the same like descriptive patterns that just the general public uses. Like, I'll refer to a player as our flash player. I'll refer yeah. to a player as our info player, our duelist, and then. The one thing that usually varies is instead of re referring to a player as our sentinel, I'll refer to them as an anchor. Like that, that is like the only distinction that I will make at like a, a nomenclature level is because I think by referring to them as a senti, you are like fundamentally mis, uh, 
attributing what that role does. Okay. In the same vein, though, like, if I were to use that logic, I wouldn't call our Flash player a Flash player. I hate the word flex, though, so I refuse to use that. <laughs> yeah, I think calling, no, someone, very a, calling, someone, right? a, calling someone a flex player just means that you don't understand what their role is. That's my hot take. If you ever say that your player is a flex, what you're actually saying is, I have no idea what the fuck this player does. <laughs> so... Yeah, this is. I think. I, I think we can get a little bit deeper on this, right? So, for for example, that player would often become, if you were playing a double duelist comp and an aggro comp with two duelists, then they would probably mm -hmm. play play your second duelist, right? And mm -hmm. I'm kind of inferring. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I understand your your system, but I guess maybe it's it's helpful to kind of hear from you. How would you define what what they would do in a team more broadly, rather than just they're your flash player? What, what obviously? Okay, I mean, I'm, I'll leave it to you because. I think it's interesting yeah, to hear so, it from you. So, I mean, like, the, the easiest example is, like, you've got, like, the, this is our flash initiator, they they pivot on to raise on our double dive maps. Hmm. Like, that's that's the archetype that I think is, like, the most, like, plug and play to, to sort of discuss this. And it's, like, all that player is, if you want to actually describe their role, hmm. is they are your second in or your first trade, is what I like to refer to it as. And so it's their job to optimize synergies with your duelists, understand duelists routes pretty much as well as the duelist does and understand the proclivity of your duelist to overheat because it's mm. their job to rein in that duelist when they need to and we'll or make sure out. they're in a position so that we're not negative on headcount when that duelist does their crazy shit because like i'll be the first one to admit duelists will do stuff sometimes that i'm like you're trolling and then they'll kill four people but <laughs> yeah, yeah like <laughs> very relatable yeah yeah but at the same time if you uh, create a system where you're second in regardless of whether they're on a raise or they're on a ko can like create um like some form of like variance mitigation on the duelist's mm. like wild unhinged nastiness like that that will just help your team <laughs> yeah yeah, I, I, so think, like, I think that's a great that's way to explain not a, it. That's not a flex player. Like, that is a very clear role. Like, a flex doesn't capture any of what I just described, other than the fact that they're playing multiple agents. Yeah, so I'm trying to think of... So, for example, then, what would you do on a map where you're playing Sage? Would you would you still have that particular player play Sage? I'm trying. I'm trying to think of a comp in my mind. Like I'm trying to think of like maybe the, the old Icebox comp, right? Because then that that that's the role that they would they would play. Yeah. So playing. like old, old Icebox is going to be Sage, KJ, Sova, Jet, and Viper, right? Yeah. And the Sage role in that is totally jacked up. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> it's wild because because it's not a second in. It's definitely not like a positional fragger or a third in. No, he's it's just putting a wall down. <laughs> it's it's not an extremity anchor. It's literally like, it, I mean, it is unironically a suicide bomber. Their job is to go in, get get the bomb down, and die most of the time. Like, that's literally the job, which is crazy. But, I mean, I think... Because this is where yeah. the things start to fall apart a little bit, right? This yeah. is where... Well, it's... Cause... it's, it's... <laughs> Here, here, you want my like brutally honest hot take on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason it starts falling apart here is because this map is poorly balanced. Okay, okay. The, the, the fact that this role goes so far outside of the norm and there's no analog in any other map in the pool is indicative mm. of a systemic problem. It's not a role issue. It's a, this is so egregious of an outlier. Why is this happening? And it's because... Some like this play pattern should never be as efficient as it is from a balanced perspective, in my opinion. Yeah, I... you you shouldn't be able to say it is objectively correct for me to assign one of my five players as a suicide bomber. Like mm -hmm. that that shouldn't be something. Where as a tactician, you're like, yes, this is optimal, and yet on Icebox, it is objectively optimal. That's probably not great. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, maybe we slightly veer off course with this discussion in some ways, what we could quite easily, because then it comes to the question of what do you want to see from balance, right? Because yeah. if, if 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 maps aren't inherently imbalanced in some ways, then you're just going to see the same comp everywhere, right? Because objectively, mm -hmm. mathematically, there will be simply a best comp. Yeah. But I guess it depends on to what extreme you take that. 
my my take and this is obviously like my personal bias in the way that i would like to see things balanced is you want to design maps that have geometry that favor different styles not maps that create fundamentally different role silos for player roles mm. um so like you can easily create a map that has a natural inclination to bias for acro teams or mid-range teams or control teams you can yeah. do that without creating an environment where player role a gets completely upended and this player's function has to completely warp in a way that it doesn't have to in any other map to accommodate just like this weird niche interaction how many how many top riot devs understand strategy to that level i think the answer is probably very few to, to give credit where due i think it's actually many of them i i spoke okay. with the dev team when i was down in la for champs and like one of the ones that I spoke to is an ex-Pro Tour Magic the Gathering player. They yeah, absolutely okay. understand this sort of system. I've talking, uh, I've talked to to devs like uh, Ryan about mid-range in the past when he was developing Gecko. Like, they are aware of and at least want to understand these concepts. Mm. Um, and so I think it's there, at least on the agent design side of things. Yeah. Whether or not the channels um, cross to a degree where the map and the agent design understanding coalesce is sort of the broader question right yeah because i was quite funny I mean, we've been scrubbing icebox recently and it was just like well this map hasn't changed <laughs> really it's not it's since so last funny time because it get, it got like all of the changes got leaked and i'm like oh how much room is there for innovation here and i was like it's not a whole lot <laughs> like, yeah i mean it would become a new really map right a really lot. There'd like, have to be an uh, overhaul. I was like, oh, we, we can go Viper Harbor now. No, we definitely can't go Viper Harbor now. You still have to play Sage on this map. Otherwise, you're just actually throwing. Um, mm. And that feels kind of bad, to be honest. So I think fo this follows very naturally on from this, I guess, about, about compositions, right? Of course, maps can have a natural inclination towards a particular composition. Icebox <laughs> is maybe a very extreme example of okay, well, if you don't play Sage, you're like probably trolling. Extreme. Yeah. Well, I mean, and like um, when I say trolling, like you can win the map without a Sage. But again, it's the I'm the guy who chases half percents. Yeah, so if you're saying yeah. I could opt into a half a percent here and you say I'm not going to, I'm going to say you're trolling because yeah. that is that is provable advantage that you could have and you're choosing not to take it. But then how much? So this, this comes to, to a kind of broader question. How do I then choose a comp as a team? If I know that, if I can provably show that one of my players is a plus 2.5% if they, I don't know, play Phoenix or something completely ridiculous, yep. right? Then how much do I lean into that? Where do we kind of draw that line? It, it, like it, you're having a discussion of optimal now versus optimal later. And mm -hmm. it's, do we want to chase quick results or do we want to chase long-term optimization? Like, how do we want to peak now or do we want to peak later? Um, because I think going for, like, in your example, the Phoenix that is, like, ultra mechanical god mode is going to be positive delta in the short term. We are not aspiring to be optimized on a broader level. We are mm -hmm. optimizing around conditions that are outliers, are likely inconsist uh, inconsistent, and don't have a large enough sample size to have any sort of verification outside of our mm -hmm. own little bubble. And so which of those two things do we want to lean into? Do we want to gamble that this internal single point of data is correct and assume that that's going to work out for us in the longer term? Or do we want to start moving towards the longer term optimization and aspire to the thing that is theoretically correct? I think that's a great answer. And in some ways comes back, I think, a little to maybe more systemic problems right is well actually no i need to perform tomorrow yeah right? well i mean there's there I mean, is there's no there, i've got a i've got a week i've got a week off season yeah <laughs> you know i whatever. mean i i coached collegiate for just under three years there were absolutely mm. times where i was like we just straight up don't have the time to implement this map correctly here's a comfort comp that i know we can execute on and we're gonna just try and run it with fundamentals beat them mm. on a team coordination level not a compositional optimization one and hope it pans out mm. Mm. I think this you probably have a have a real answer to this question. I mean, I, I understand statistics very well because my so my background's in chemistry, right? Like I've got, mm -hmm. got so I've got a PhD in chemistry. And so 
I think I understand statistics generally pretty well. It's been a big part of my, know how you got my job. <laughs> um, but generally not something I implement so much in Valorant. So I, I think mm -hmm. I've got to have that mind and, and, and I, I love the systems. I don't maybe spend so much time on, on the statistics. Mm -hmm. Th these kind of little percentage games, I think are quite a, quite a, a challenging one sometimes, right? I'm trying to remember exactly what I was going to say now, and it's just like, it's just got away from me. No, no, me, it's all good. Me... I mean, I can elaborate a little bit on, like, how I think you can use stats effectively if you think I would, like, dragnet the topic. Because, I mean, it sounds like I'm, like, realistically, this, this is, like, people are going to be like, oh, you weren't, blah, blah, blah. I'm realistically the first person who actually tried to apply statistics to Valorant in a strategic sense. Yeah, um, to that level, definitely. Uh, because like when I first started my YouTube channel, I was manually scraping statistics from VODs. Run mm. it back didn't exist. VLR didn't exist in a capacity where there were any statistics. I was literally the first one to do this. The stats I was pulling didn't exist outside of my own desktop. Mm. Um, oftentimes when you're chasing these small percentages, people are like, okay, well, how do you distinguish that from noise? Like, is that within standard deviations to the point where mm. it's just variance? Mm. Like, are you just, it, I, if I'm remembering the term correctly, it's called apophenia, which is finding patterns where they don't exist simply because you're looking for them. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people fear that that is what you do when you apply statistics to a game like Valorant. Um, in the early days, I would say that that was a genuine concern. I would say at this point, there's like it's undeniable that there's validity to it. Just because... The key thing with statistics is you're never using them to say, like, this is irrefutably better than X in this specific scenario. You're saying, based off of a mass of data at baseline, this should outperform this the majority of the time, given the context that it is based in the current metagame. Like, yeah, I think yeah. people, like, egregiously misuse statistics when they often try to apply them. Because they will say that, like, this statistic is just, like, a binary answer to, like, this hypothesis that I want to test against the metagame instead of what story does the statistic tell me and what is the context that frames it. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think that an example of that that comes up very frequently uh, is you can pull statistics on the, like, post-plant slash retake success rates of every single site yeah in every map in the game and people will use that to determine like wh where they should strong side their sites when they're building playbooks we need to contextualize that in the sense that those statistics are warped by the extant meta if people are strong siding a all of the time then that's going to change <laughs> yeah. those statistics like if, yeah. if 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 the steady state assumption is every team strong sides a then we need to understand that that is a driver of where those numbers are. Mm. And if it's, mm. if it's very like you need to be able to create like the, the sort of thousand foot view of like, okay, cognitively, this is what the meta is doing. This is what those statistics resulted uh, or result in given that meta premise. What's like the real values for those numbers if i try to assess them in a vacuum and try to think about them in like a meta agnostic sort of way mm -hmm. like if this is where we're at with everyone strong siding a if they strong side b what how do i expect these numbers to change and mm -hmm. that will be contextual to like what does this map look like what are the rotational paths is it favorable uh like do i think like the way you have to route exposes you to undo risk like people will just look at the those numbers and be like oh this site is like way harder to convert post plants in. And I'm like, yeah, it's because there's always three people there, dumbass. Like, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. pe people pass go and collect $200 before they think about what's happening. Yeah, I mean, I think basic statistics is probably something that most people, most people probably didn't even get to a point where they studied even what, what one standard deviation actually is. It's probably something I would say that less than half of the population That's knows. <laughs> probably right. I, I mean, like, this is me having bias to an extreme degree like i tutored statistics in college and 
my degree obviously makes extensive use of it so like it's hard I'm right when you surround yourself them, with those people like, yeah <laughs> yeah i yeah, just everyone... assume that everyone understands why this works the way it works it's like ah yep. yes because of course context is always important right and questioning our underlying assumptions certainly certainly in my line of work is often a really important part of the job is well the number can tell you one thing but are the underlying assumptions actually actually mm -hmm. correct there's more to it than the number and i think people falsely use that like amount of depth as a way to discredit the use of statistics altogether which i think is like that's just ignorant at that point mm -hmm. i think it's also a common problem where um someone might quote a statistic I mean, this goes much broader more broadly than valorant but i think it definitely applies mm -hmm. to this context where you can quote a statistic and simply because the other person doesn't understand it they can't then refute it right they can't then they can't mm -hmm. then argue against it because they don't know where it's come from or, or anything yep. about it and so there's then no there's no fair debate yep um, and i think that and definitely that definitely comes up a lot I, and i think that there are certainly scenarios in the past where, as a coach, I've created uncomfortable situations for players dealing with that same uh, with that same challenge. Yeah, because I will yeah. I will bring numbers that I know I have vetted to the ends of the earth and have like full trust in, and I'll be like, "Here's this number that quantifiably says that either what you're doing is incorrect or what I'm uh, like." Uh, sort of driving for is superior yeah and they sort of have to have an implicit trust in me that i know what the yeah. hell i'm doing and yeah. or they have to know what questions to ask to understand that better and there's mm. not a lot i can do from the perspective of the person bringing these numbers to just naturally make them more comfortable with that because they would i would have to teach them a statistics class first and well, like, I get, that I... is a very hard thing to to overcome i think this is often where like the system of having that kind of that central head coach position is is so good right because you then mm -hmm. as a strategic coach or an analyst or however you would like to define your title you can you know you work with the head coach the head coach is obviously the one that has to and should you would hope can, can at least have a very at least a, a kind of decent level understanding of, of what you're trying to to get at so that they can then persuade the player in a way that's kind yeah. of understandable and yeah i think that's important right that's that's why the dynamics that's where coaching dynamics are also so important I, kind of staff as a whole and agreeing that the a system driven statistics driven decision making process you know that, that that's something that you're going to all kind of be on board with and yeah. that you agree is actually the best the best approach for the team especially in the, in, in the long run I remembered what I was what I was thinking of earlier. Okay, perfect. So, what about kind of, I mean, the lack of a better term, like meme comps, right? You know, we've put yep. this 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 factor of of surprise, right? I mean, it goes broader than just the the, the implications of a composition. Of course, it, it can can be a factor in the game too, right? Surprise is definitely something I think that that matters. I think this this circles circles around to another question actually. But meme comps, where do you kind of how, how how do you feel about that? Kind of bringing that level of uncertainty into your compositions so that people can, you know, especially at the highest level, mm -hmm. you know, how 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 do we quantify that? How do we say, well, actually, if we just go for a kind of crazy comp, we know our fundamentals are really good. Does that can that give give us a, a measurable advantage? Can it give you an advantage? Absolutely. Can it give you a measurable one? No. Be because the the whole idea of it is that so instead of calling them meme comps the way that i refer to them categorically is their novelty comps you you are doing them as a one-off novelty that your opponent will not have preparation for or like uh have preset protocols for and so the way that you're gleaning your positive delta is i am testing my opponent's ability to adapt to this very quickly with no pre-existing context Mm -hmm. And so in a lot of ways, if you were going to try to measure that edge, you would look at your opponent and how yeah. they deal with out, with non-meta compositions. Yeah, outliers. If I, yeah. I, I can literally look at a team and say, huh, when this team plays Haven and they play anything other than the meta composition, 
they have a 28% win rate on the map, I should probably not play meta against them because they're just going to flounder around and probably lose. And yeah, yeah. like there are literally teams where the statistic is that bad, by the way. Where it's yeah. if they're not playing meta, they literally collapse in on themselves. Mm. Um, and so like that would be the closest way to measure it. But like by virtue of it being a novelty, there is no data to measure it with. That's that's kind of the whole idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I love that though, right? Because I think that's a really good way to approach it. And I think often why there could be so much variance at kind of tier three, tier two, certainly that, that that transition point where someone just pulled out and said, we just played five duelist and we just won. Yep. Because they didn't have any idea. They didn't have good protocols. They didn't have good systems to fall back on. And of course they then just, just totally fell apart. Yep. So sticking to this kind of topic of surprise, if we always make the right decision in game, then we're totally predictable, right? And this element of, yep. of unpredictability and surprise kind of goes out the window right and if you have two perfect teams of course this isn't this isn't actually what happens right but in, in, in theoretical terms if you have two perfect teams then actually making the wrong decision would be the right decision yep it, it's like where do we find that balance what, what are your kind of thoughts on it it's kind of more philosophical it, 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 it's all in-game context right because you're you're gonna end up in this weird scenario where at a certain point there's like a paradox right where it's like if both teams are playing perfectly then neither team is playing perfectly mm. because otherwise you would just end up in a scenario where n like neither team ever wins and that's impossible um mm. in some ways you could argue that if both teams play perfectly defense always wins because that's just an inherent design characteristic of the game yes um but I think that's like a total cop out answer and, and not really like realistic. There, there's a classic quote from uh, Monte Cristo, a uh, League of Legends caster, and he got so much flack for it at the time. But I think it, it is the exact same thing that we're sort of discussing here, which he said the perfect game of League of Legends is neither team ever fighting each other, picking a composition that can base race the fastest, and destroying the opponent's nexus within nine minutes. Um, <laughs> And that that is theoretically perfect League of Legends. Like you, the perfect League of Legends games has zero kills, hypothetically yeah. speaking, because there is no higher source of variance in like competition yeah. than your yeah. interaction with the other human. Period. Yes. Like that that is where the variance comes from. Um, because the game code doesn't have variance. It's all numbers, right? It's all pre generated stuff. Mm. So if I was gonna play a perfect game, I just never interact with my opponents. I'd say fuck off and go win somewhere else. Um. And I think when it comes to, like, perfect play and, like, perfect play driving value in theoretically imperfect decisions, it, 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 like, it all comes down to that human nature, right? Like, how perfectly do you expect your opponent to play? How, uh, like, to what extent do you think that they're going to take risks that are outside of the norm or these, like, theoretically perfect play patterns? And to a like to a weird degree, you almost have to ask yourself, because of natural human error, is there ever a point where making these perfect plays actually becomes a negative? Because the whole premise of this is like, if you play perfect all the time, you become predictable. Is there enough natural variance in like humans' interaction with the game where that's not actually true? Mm. Because I think that. In, in a similar way, people would people look at the game of Valorant and compare it to Counter Strike, and they're like, "Oh, like you always something that this was super common in the early days." They'd be like, "You can't play retake on this site, like you just can't, because like it's impossible to retake or whatever." Or um, once the spike gets down, like your retake percentage is too low, or like things of that sort. There is so much suffocating utility in this game that it breaks conventional norms like there you can literally make it the, uh, hypothetically to where a site is unplayable there is enough ground denial utility in the game where you can kill everyone standing on an entire site mm. and so to tell me that like you have to play the game certain ways is probably not true and so it like speaking in absolutes where it's like this is like playing at the perfect level is going to be incorrect at some point i don't think that that's necessarily accurate i think that there's definitely opportunities in this game to pursue a perfect line of play 
that when done correctly is so oppressive that it doesn't matter that your opponent knows it's predictable. It still just wins. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it as well, um, I guess my kind of analysis of what perfect play looks like actually would still come down to timings, right? Because it's mm -hmm. not perfect play if everyone is able to see the map, right? And everyone has perfect information. Yes, of course, then, then that actually exists. But we don't ever have perfect information, right? No. Well, very rarely. I guess sometimes you might have perfect information in a particular point in the game. Um, well, yeah, the start of the round where, you know, they're all still in spawn. But I mean, that, that plays a part, right? Is, is, is the timings of it. Mm -hmm. Well, and I mean, even in scenarios where you have quote unquote perfect information, there's still the import, uh, the unknown information of what your opponent's actively thinking of their next move, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you can, uh, you could give me map hack and that still doesn't give me information on opponent intent. Um, mm -hmm. I can make an informed decision about what I think is the opponent intent, but there is no way to fully remove Fog of War in this game in a like more like theoretical sense. In a literal sense, yes, you could remove Fog of War, but there's no such thing as perfect information in this game. There never will be. Um, I think this must, this must come... Uh, you know, I think you've studied military tactics a lot more than most people as well. I think... That, this is obviously a real thing in the real world, right? We do not have yep. perfect information, especially yep. now. We must have contingency to, to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's... The sort of implied impossibility of perfect information just means that you have to build systems that are dynamic enough to deal with that reality, right? Mm. Like... Um, the person who I credit as realistically the smartest modern strategist and tactician in human history is John Boyd. He's a U.S. Air Force uh, individual who came up with maneuver warfare, which became part of uh, like core U.S. military doctrine. Um, and one of the elements of that is like the now widely applied OODA loop. Like people apply that to business. People apply that to tons of things outside of general military theory. Um, and all the OODA loop says is that you observe, you orient, you decide, and then you act. And one of his sort of core preachings was that, like, one of the core elements of succeeding in conflict is to OODA loop faster than your opponent and to get inside <sighs> their OODA loop. Yeah, yeah. That's literally all it boils down to is I'm going to OODA loop faster <clears throat> than you, I'm going to get inside and disrupt your OODA loop, and that's how I'm going to win. Yeah, yeah. You know, actually, I, I honestly love that. I love that as a principle, right? It's, if you can understand, if I can understand what you're going to do before you understand what you're going to do, then then I've won, right? Or, or if I'm just iterating faster to the point where you can't keep up with my iterations. Like, it, it, there's two ways to go about it. There's get inside and disrupt your opponents so that you know what they're doing before they know what they're going to do. Or I'm just so far ahead of you that you can't keep up. Like, mm -hmm. either of those will ultimately result in, in me succeeding and you failing. Um but they both use the same system to get there, right? Like, mm. Mm. This has been really insightful, Martin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Of um, course. We're kind of getting to the end now. So I guess, what kind of parting advice would you give to aspiring tier one players, people in tier two, tier three, that, that want to take the next step? You know, they're already watching your content. How can they go and better themselves to get an advantage in the scene and, and, and to push themselves towards tier one. I mean, this is like, it, it always feels like kind of a well duh kind of answer, but it still remains probably the most like undertake, like it, it's the piece of advice that people take the least, which is just do shit. Like, uh, Stop talking about how you want to bridge the gap from tier two to tier one or tier three to tier two or whatever. Go find a team. Set up like a proper structure. Make sure that you're finding players who are bought into the type of system that's going to allow you to succeed and start grinding. I didn't get to where I am by talking about how I was going to get there and figuring out the perfect way to get there. I got here by starting to work with a team, sticking it out with them for a year and a half, and then getting mm -hmm. signed to tier one. That was my journey, is I put my nose to the grindstone and I started working hard. 
And as long as you are actually working hard and not thinking about how you're going to work hard, you'll get there eventually. Mm. Actions do speak louder than words. Thank you so much. Anyone, everyone should be following this guy. Obviously, so much great content. And, and I, I look forward to, to seeing more stuff from you, obviously. So thank you so Appreciate much. Cheers. Bye-bye.